Well, good evening, LCM. Good evening. Tonight is Wednesday, November 11th, 2020. We're excited to be here with you tonight. I just got to start off by saying, man, our lives are incredibly good, aren't they? Amen. Come on, church. Hasn't the Lord been really, really good to us here? Amen. He's speaking to us constantly. He's bringing healing in our bodies. He is flooding our families with babies. With lots and lots of babies, there's no more announcement for that one. I just wanted to bring that one up. It's almost like we don't even need to wait till Thanksgiving to be thankful in this house because God is with us. Look, we have such a good life. The truth is that sometimes we're just looking for things to complain about. I mean, like, your complaints aren't really that much complaints because you just got to find something. You know, like the Chick-fil-A building that's right there in Mission Bend that, that is no longer... Don't know what we're going to do for lunch anymore. Pastor, the reason I was late because the traffic on Eldridge is horrible. I felt like Jesus won't, was going to make it back before I got to church. <laughs> <laughs> your, your cell phone is dead and, and you can't find your extra battery charger that you live in such a, a, a glorious land. When they, when they put milk in your Starbucks drink and you're lactose intolerant or they, they mess up your name again and again. Uh, Adam Cola, Abs and Strola, I mean Abimbola. <laughs> <laughs> the, the truth is, abs and stroller. <laughs> Everybody's like, oh, that's really true. Babies okay. on babies on babies. The truth is, is it becomes very easy to complain about the most ridiculous things around us. Yep. So ridiculous that there's a couple of phrases that are used for this. It's called first world problems. Like, in other words, they're not really problems at all. Or another one, which actually leads us to the title of our sermon tonight is um, hashtag the struggle is real. The struggle is real. See, it's so used that in our society, the phrase the struggle is real has become a humorous way to describe problems that the truth is, is they're not really problems, are they? As a matter of fact, we have some definitions that we want to show you. This is uh, our infamous almighty Google. It says to make forceful or violent efforts to get free of restraint or constriction. That's like the 2011 version of Google. We're riding a struggle bus trying to get out of it, trying to get away from it. That's what our, our generation defines the struggle as. Wow. Trying to get away from something. Trying to escape out of something that is difficult. Now see, some of you young whoopersnappers wouldn't oh, know this, but we actually we have another definition that we want to show you. See, this one is talking about getting away from something. It's talking about something that's causing restraint. The struggle is only used in a negative connotation. Some type of constriction or confinement that you got to get out of. You got to run away from. Let me show you this one from the 1928 Webster's Dictionary. Got to take it back old school. I mean, we're talking like almost 200 years ago, but here we go. To properly, properly to strive or to make efforts with the twisting or with contortions of the body. In other words, it's something that your entire life, your entire body has to engage with these struggles. Number two, to use great efforts. Somebody say great efforts. Great efforts. To struggle is to use great efforts, to label, labor hard, to strive, to contend as to struggle to save life. Come on now. This is just in the dictionary of 1828. To struggle as to save life, to struggle with waves, to struggle against the stream, to struggle with adversity. There's something about being able to struggle that causes you and it makes you to be able to overcome. It actually brings about life. This is just Webster's Dictionary. To labor in pain or in anguish, to be in agony, to labor in any kind of difficulty or distress. Church, we want you to understand tonight, we're not talking about the kind of we're not talking about the kind of struggle that you need to run away from. No. We're, not kind of, we're not talking about the kind of struggle that you've created by your own sinfulness, by your own silliness, by your own selfly desires. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a struggle that is important because it is going to save lives in this house. Can somebody say amen? amen. We're going to talk to you tonight about the struggle that is real. The actual real struggle that is needed. So turn with us. To Deuteronomy chapter 4, so we can understand the kind of struggle that we need to be looking at tonight. Say the struggle is real when you get there. Come on. That sounds like a struggle I need, Pastor. Deuteronomy 420. But as for you, the Lord took you and brought you out 
of the iron smelting furnace out of Egypt to be the people of his inheritance as you now are. Moses was speaking to Israel here. We are speaking to you tonight. The Lord, in fact, took them out of the iron smelting furnace. Sounds like a place of struggle to me. They were there with the great efforts and hard labor for a reason. It had a purpose. Our struggles have a purpose. The struggle was making them into something. It wasn't harming them. It wasn't disadvantaging them. The struggles were making them into something. Same for us in this place. Transforming them to be the people of his inheritance. That's one of our gates. As you now are. Out of all times, it should seem that the struggle should be over, right? Like, we just came out of 400 plus years of slavery. Uh, a pharaoh who was cruel. 400 plus years. Our troubles are done. We, we out of Egypt. We are free, right? To do exactly what we want to do. And call it God. No. But, but this echoes our hearts. I shouldn't have to be struggling with this anymore. I'm not talking about struggling with sin. Let's get that point clear now. I'm not talking about struggling with sin. I'm talking about the attitude that says nothing should be hard for me. I shouldn't have to travail. I came out of Egypt. I'm born again. I'm a believer. So were they. Now he's taking us out of one area of struggle. Shouldn't we make a forceful, diligent effort to keep away from any further struggle? We should? No. Gotcha. you. Church, you know the history, and you can already discern our point. Does the refinement ever end? Do we ever really leave the iron smelting furnace? We leave the, the furnace of judgment, but we never leave the refinement that God has for us, and that's what makes us his own. That's what makes us into the people of God and keeps us the people of God. Why? Because the struggle is real. Come on, church. The idea here in this passage you see that they were brought out of the iron smelting furnace. Man, that's, that could sound like some of our days that we're in now, isn't it? Some, some furnaces that are smelting us, that are working things into us. Why? To be the people of his inheritance as you now are. Come on, that struggle that was there is for your good. This has been the way that it's always been. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 32. Say the struggle is real when you get there. Genesis 32 in verse 24, it says this. So Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched. And he wrestled as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. See, we're picking up in this story in Genesis 32. It was two camps. Actually, it was a lot more than two camps that Jacob had made. It should have been a singular camp. He had sent his entire family. He broke them into, into sections and he sent them on ahead. Everybody in his family is now in front of him. Everyone has crossed in front of him and now he's alone. Can I just tell you right now that even by yourself, the struggle is real? Anybody ever realize that all I need is just a few minutes away from the kids. All I need is a few minutes um, away from work. <laughs> Hopefully not your spouse. But all I need is a few minutes by myself. But then once you do get by yourself, you realize that the problem and the struggle hasn't gone away. Yeah. That the struggle is still there because the struggle is real because it's inside of you. Yeah. There's something that still needs to be worked out in you. This is not kind of a three-minute round that Jacob gets into in wrestling. In actual wrestling, or as my dad used to say back in the day, wrestling. My brother as a wrestling coach hated that maybe more than anything else in our family. Dad is not wrestling. I said, I said he thought he was saying wrestling the entire time. See, there's no three-minute rounds in this kind of wrestling and struggling with what the Lord has for us. It's an all-night battle that Jacob engages in. Jacob is still wrestling even as the angel touches his hip. If you're like me, maybe you thought growing up that that was the end of the wrestling match. It's not. He's wrestling. He gets, he gets a, the, the angel that touches him in his hip. His hip is wrenched. And then the angel says, yeah, it's time. It's daybreak. 
I'm going to call this. It's, I'm calling for a truce now. No, 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 no. No, it doesn't matter. The struggle is real. We're going to keep wrestling until we get and achieve the blessing. Until we achieve the victory that God has for us. Now, you guys know this passage. You guys understand this concept. For goodness sake, you're LCM. You're not looking. You don't think that you're looking to get around the struggle. But I can tell you that we are all looking to call a truce with the wrestling that we have right before us. What does this look like in our lives? What about when God speaks to you? Are you measuring the response? Are you calculating the potential problems? Are you coming up with probable failures even as he has spoken to you? See, those things are actually the parts of you that are stepping away from the struggle instead of stepping into it. You've got to wrestle with the things that God has spoken. You've got to trust in the Lord and not lean upon your own understanding. You've got to go after this in a way that Jacob understood. In a way that Jacob said, I'm not going to leave this place. It doesn't matter that I'm injured. It doesn't matter that we've been wrestling all night. I don't know if you've ever wrestled before. I don't know if you've ever just been horsing around with a friend. If you wrestle for more than two or three minutes, you're sweating. You're breathing heavy. This is a difficult, difficult task that's before you. Some of the young guys in the room are like, no, that's true. That's true. If you're like the four young men who are now grown men and mighty, mighty, godly men. But when they were teenagers and lived in our house, in a single room, it was not unusual to have many, many broken things. Broken couches, broken dishes, broken tables. Yes, because they were wrestling all the time. And it always ended up with sweaty, smelly nastiness. We have to have an attitude that says we're going to wrestle until we get to a place of victory, until we get to a place of anointing, until we get to a place of, of blessing that God has for us. Church, I want us to grab this tonight. I want us to wrestle with this. I want us to struggle with this and get something good. That we can't just think we're engaging in wrestling and really be playing pity pat with each other. We've got to actually get in and struggle with what God has for us. Let's, let's take a look at another passage that will help us understand this. Turn to Hosea 12. Hosea 12 too. What we're fighting for tonight, and what our brothers have been fighting for on Monday nights, is for the heart to complete a task. For the heart to carry something through to completion. And God has given us many tasks. He's given me many tasks. And what we're fighting for, what we're trying to cultivate is a heart that carries it through to completion all the way. Not settling for anything because God doesn't settle. Hosea 12, 2. You there? <laughs> That's right. The Lord has a charge to bring against Judah. He will punish Jacob according to his ways and repay him according to his deeds. In the womb, he grasped his brother's heel. As a man, he struggled with God. He struggled with the angel and overcame him. Wait, I thought he struggled with a man in, Gen in uh, Genesis 32. He wept and begged for his favor. Sounds like a little desperation. He found him at Bethel and talked with him there. The Lord, the, the Lord God Almighty, the Lord is his name. But you must return to your God, maintain love and justice, and wait for your God always. Jacob's whole life was about the struggle. From the womb, as a man, ange angelic beings, struggling for the favor of God. When I heard the summary of, of Jacob, as Pastor shared it with me, I thought about my fathers in this church. We're not unaccustomed to men who know how to struggle. We're not unaccustomed with men who know how to put their heads down and in the midst of difficulty all over, do exactly what the Lord told them to do the way he told them to do it. We're not unaccustomed with men who dug this church out of the ground to create something that is useful for the king and now is sending us to go get the nations. Amen. We're not unaccustomed to looking at that. I myself have been around men with, with a raging fire and, and found myself warmed by their fire. But that's not good enough. Not anymore. You see here that although Jacob was used to the struggle, Jacob was used to scratching something out of the earth. Something didn't pass to his generations. God is bringing a charge not to Jacob the man, but Jacob the people. And this is us. We, we like, like Pastor, Pastor uh, Matt gave us an excellent word about sending reinforcements Sunday. Amen. We don't lack 
direction in this church. I'm not talking about daily bread, which you, which you be getting out the word every day. But we don't lack direction for our lives. God has spoken to us abundantly and continues to do so. Amen. So we don't lack in that. I, you, y'all been to my bachelor party. I don't lack in direction for my life. <laughs> what I'm trying to work out, what we are working out is how to put faith to what God has said, yeah. to carry it through, to learn how to struggle. That is what this body needs to mature. Hey, before Justin keeps going, does, can anybody relate to the fact that you've gotten plenty of words here? You've got plenty of direction. You've got plenty of understanding of, of what you must be doing and what you must be aiming for. What we're talking about tonight is that you get in there and you struggle and have the fire inside of you. Hosea is talking about and is using the man Jacob in his life. That from before he was born, as a baby, you see him grasping at his brother's heel. He started off in struggle, but that struggle continued on as a man. It continued on whether it was with angelic beings or not. And what happened is, is it didn't get to the rest of the people. And now they're using Jacob as not only the man, but they're talking about the people. Yeah. We're not talking about a single man in this room. Understanding that the struggle is real. We're talking about the people. The collective that has to understand that this struggle is something that is good for us. It's something that's needed. And look at what he says in verse 6. But you must return to your God. Maintain love and justice. And wait for your God always. You must return to the right struggle the way our fathers have. The struggle that welcomes adversity because you know what it's going to produce. Not the struggle that seeks to shrink back from, from a little bit of difficulty, a little bit of, a bit of heartache in the area. Having to face the reality that this area in, in our lives, this area in your life is not where it should be. There's a struggle that God has given you to make you into the people of God. As a, matter of fuck, as a matter of fact, we must grow up and look forward to this struggle. We must grow up and look forward to the, the straining that it requires. Because God isn't disqualifying me in that struggle. He's actually qualifying me. But what do we say? What did they say? But we have. We have obeyed the Lord our God. We will do everything he told us to do. Yeah, right. <laughs> struggling and quitting is not the same as struggling until we receive God's blessing. Until we receive the stamp of approval that says this is where it, the way it needs to be. Oh, come on. That's a good so when, we, when I go talk to the pastor and I'm like, oh, pastor, I'm struggling. That is not the struggling I'm talking about. The struggling that we're talking about is like Elder Bar said. How's your day? Good or bad is awesome. Because I know what God has called me to. This, oh man, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling is more so a, a way for your flesh to escape. That's the 2011 version of, of the word uh, struggle. It's looking for a way out. We play escape room with the things that God brings to us. But that's not what we're doing in this church. That's not what we're learning. We are being cultivated. The Lord is literally reminding us of the original revelation so that we can go back and go through it the right way. Has anybody had any struggles this week? Any difficulties, uh, say, with your kids? Yeah. Any, any difficulties on the workplace? Yeah. Any difficulties internally just to keep your heart right? Me? Yeah, Tracer's fine. He's, he's godly. He has no struggles, right? <laughs> I want to talk to you for just a second, though, about the kind of struggling that you're doing to combat that. I have a, uh, a brother, a younger brother. I love my younger brother very much. He's, he's kind of like a cody size individual. That's my little brother. Growing up, we would go out in the backyard, and we'd have fun. We, we had no electronics, thank the Lord, because we were poor, and it's not that they didn't exist, it's that we didn't own it. <laughs> we couldn't afford it. <laughs> so it was out in the backyard. My mom was still of the f a fact that she would close the door and lock it on us out during summertime. And like, look, there's a water hose out back. You'll be fine. I'll see you when it gets dark. You shall not die. And so what we would do is we'd start playing and we're, we're, two, we're two guys. And so we'd throw a football or throw a baseball. And every once in a while, we kind of start wrestling around a little bit. We kind of we kind of start, you know, kind of jockeying back and forth just a little bit. And then inevitably, I don't know how this happened, but it happened every day of every summer growing up. There was some moment in the day where the playing got a little bit more serious. Somebody got a little hurt. Somebody 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 got somebody got hit just a little bit harder than they wanted to. 
And then the struggle took on a whole different kind of sense. It took on a bloody nature. It was not unusual for me and my brother to come inside from being, from being outside in the summertime bleeding. Dirty, bleeding, scuffed up, torn pants, whatever it was, because the struggle became actually real for us. My mom would just look at us, because my mom is awesome. She just said, go clean up. <laughs> she understood that for the boys, this was a normal part of the process. It was just our everyday attitude for things. Let me ask you something. In your struggles that you've had, most of you, 90% of you raised your hand when I'm asking about the struggles that you had this week. Was it the kind of playfulness that you have to it? Oh, that's difficult. Stop it. (laughs) Or have you been in bloody conflict with the enemy? Aren't both struggling? Yes, but one has got an intensity that is actually going to save life. It's going to bring about life when you have to engage with your kids, when you have to engage with your spouse to bring about shalom. Are you just kind of, yes, I've gone about it. I spanked my baby. Or are you understanding that there's a life and death in the struggle that we have to engage in? That your shalom in between you husbands and wife, this is a life or death situation. That your shalom with your kids, if you can't get them under control now, what's going to happen later on? You got to get after them. How are we going to reach the generations? How are we going to reach the nations? You got to be able to do in your home what you're going to replicate everywhere else. We got to get serious about it. Why? Because there is a struggle that is here that we have to engage in. But my goodness, this struggle is a good thing for us. It's actually producing something in us and it allows God to produce something through us. And when you shrink back from the struggle, Because it's just too tiring. It's just too difficult. It just requires too much of you. There's just too much fear involved. Then you are missing what the struggle brings to you. Let's turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 5 as a church. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Somebody say the struggle is real when you get there. See, the struggle is real, but you've got to be in a real struggle. You've got to actually work through this. Look at what Ecclesiastes 5 and verse 1 says. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know that they do wrong. Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your hearts to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth. In case you forgot that. <laughs> He's the one that sees rightly. So let your words be few. Church, you have to guard your steps. We know this word. It's the word shamar. It's something about us guarding. It's about us fighting. It's about there's an intensity to what God has. He's saying guard your steps. Pay attention to what's going on. That you are never supposed to be hasty in making a vow. Why? Because then you, you then have to struggle to make sure that that vow comes about. Church, how many vows have you made at this altar? How many commitments have we made to the Lord without actually guarding our steps at all? How many times have we said, Lord, I will do this, or Lord, I will never do that again. And we've made vows and then I had no intention of actually guarding that, of actually getting into the struggle and saying, I've made the vow, now I must keep it. Now I must finish what I've started. Yeah, church, the struggle is real in fulfilling your vows. That's why it says don't be hasty about making a vow. You are supposed to take your time on the front end of this. Why? Because when you make it, you're not supposed to break it. Think about your vows. Think about the things that you've said to a spouse that you would or would not do. Think about the commitments that you've made to an elder. Think about the commitments that you've made to a brother. Think about what you've said and what you've done and how quickly you entered into something with no real concern about whether you were going to struggle until it's done. Do not be quick with your mouth. Look at verse 3. A dream comes when there are many cares. (laughs) Every dream I have is from the Lord. No, it's not. 
It's not true. Dreams come when you have many cares. And many words mark the speech of a fool. When you make a vow to God, do not delay to fulfill it. He has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. What is it making an unequivocal connection to? When you make vows and don't fulfill them, then you're acting foolishly. You have the sacrifice of fools that's upon you. It's better to not make a vow than to make one and not fulfill it. See, you're never supposed to be hasty in making a vow. But once you've made the vow, you are never supposed to delay in fulfilling it. You're supposed to immediately get after the work. You can't be hasty commit to, to commit to something that God has not said. A mission plan. Your own plan. Your own agenda. But you definitely can't be slow in fulfilling it once the Lord has spoken. How is it that we get this backwards? In our society, we're quick to make the vow. I promise. I'll do that. No problem. Yeah, I got you. We're so quick to make it. But then we're slow in fulfilling it. We've got that exactly backwards. You were supposed to be slow. I mean, really slow in making sure that what you're saying, because you know that you're about to engage in a struggle. If I make this commitment, then I must fulfill it. I must continue on. I must be successful at it. No matter the cost. No matter the length of time. No matter the difficulty. I must do this. See, it's because we don't understand that the struggle is real. We don't understand this part. And so we do it exactly the opposite. Where we're hasty to make the commitment. And then we think we have an infinite amount of time to actually try to begin to fulfill what we have said. See, that's not really struggling. No. That's not struggling at all. That's something else while we're saying, yeah, the struggle's real. How easy is it for you to forget what God has said to you? How, how easily do you set that aside? How easily do you set aside what you have promised here at an altar? We vowed our lives. People in this room have vowed their children. And yet, we, when we don't see the fruit that we're expecting on by day three, we've moved on to something else. All the while agreeing and nodding and, and, and applauding Justin as he's saying the struggle is real. I want us to get an intensity in our fight today. I want you to get an intensity back in your soul that you stir something up on the inside of you. That says in what I'm doing and what I'm saying, I've got to get about this struggle because it's not just me playing pity pat with somebody. It's me actually getting involved that builds the strength that I need. Man, when you actually begin to wrestle with someone else, when you, when you lock shoulders, when you lock hands with somebody and there's a tension that's there, it takes everything that you have. It begins to wear you out in a new kind of way. But what it also does is build strength in a new kind of way. Amen. To not fulfill your vows is to offer the sacrifice of fools. But that's not what we're raising here at LCM. Amen. We're raising men and women who understand this principle. You got to struggle with all that's within you, church. If you actually thought that when you said something... You would never be allowed to not do that thing. Doesn't that make you want to really, really pay attention to what you're committing to? Yes. yes. Hey, I'm going to be there. Uh, uh, Judah, I'm going to be there. I'll be there in an hour. Okay, well, when I said an hour, what I really meant was 10 days later. See, it's better for you not to make a vow, not to make a commitment, not to say something. But we're not just talking about showing up and meeting Judah somewhere. We're talking about gaining what the Lord has gotten and what he's prescribed for us. What he told us that he will do in our midst about our children, about our call, about our mission. The Lord is doing something in our midst. Let's turn to Luke chapter 13. Let's talk about how the struggle is real. Say the struggle is real when you're there. He replied. Go tell that fox, I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today, tomorrow, and on the third day. Say today. Today. Say tomorrow. Tomorrow. Say the third day. Third day. I will reach my goal. 
In any case, I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day. For surely no prophet can die outside of Israel. We see here. We see here this is our life. When it all boils down to it, we say we want to be like Jesus. And we do. This is what we're called to reflect. The key to achieving the goal that's been set out for you, not the goal you've set out for yourself, but the direction that the Lord has given you. The key to that is to set your expectations rightly. They came to Jesus. Jesus, he's going to kill you. He's, he, he, he's trying to kill you. And over and over again, he was not worried because he already knew that. His goals were set on what the father had already showed him. When Paul got the news that there was hardship and struggles in Jerusalem, it didn't faze him. He already had his expectations set. He knew what he was going to Jerusalem for. He wasn't looking to escape suffering, death, or sacrifice. He welcomed it because he knew it was the salvation of the world. That's what he did. What about us? We, we, I know you. Everybody here wants to achieve the call of God in their life. Amen. What we're learning to do is to put that to the side a little bit and achieve the, achieve the, the call of God on this body's uh, life. Yeah. The call that he's given, the mission that he's given us. Yeah. What's required is that we set our expectations rightly. Yeah. Not on what we want. Not on what we think God should give us. Not on the level of struggle that we're willing to endure that seems reasonable, but the expectation that he set. Amen. Monday night, pastors led us in the tabernacle. And we begin to cry out. And what our pastors led us in is that, Lord, if you've made me a pillar at this church, if, 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 you've, if you've set me here, Lord, let my children go. Let my children go. And... That weight set on me because I already know that's going to happen. I already know where my sons are going. I'm preparing my sons to go and win. I'm preparing my sons to go and die. Die to flesh, yes, but I mean, I mean die. And win and die if necessary. That weight set on me at the altar. But how are they going to learn that? For me. And they're not going to learn it from me just talking about it. They're not going to learn it from me complaining. They will have to see the willingness to die, both figuratively and literally, in my life, for them to be ready to go and do what God has told them to do. That is what, that is not some uh, set apart calling for, for one person or two people. We are all called to live that way. Amen. This is how we overcome this attitude. I set my expectations rightly on what God sets my expectations on. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not an island unto myself. I don't belong to myself anymore. I died. He now lives in me. My expectations are set. This is how we overcome. We set our expectation on straining, on struggling, and sacrificing to attain his promise. Yeah. And what's more, we do it how he did it, with joy. Because he know, we know that it's producing salvation just like he produced salvation for the world. His physical work on this earth is done. It's us now. He set you here to go and, and, and carry out his mission. The work falls to us. We got to teach our sons to overcome. Our children to overcome. Our wives to overcome. They're going to get it from us. Come on, church. Man, I love what Justin just said. I love under the unction of the Holy Spirit what this man is teaching to, teaching to you tonight, speaking to you, sharing with you. You realize that he doesn't yet have sons, right? He's not using a figurative term here. <laughs> Lord has spoken to him that he will have sons and he knows where he wants to send them. Come on, that's talking about a struggle that we need to engage with. That's talking about something that's more than just you. That's talking about you having to get the struggle down right in you so that you can bring it to your wife, so that you can bring it to your kids, so that you can keep this going forward the way it should. Matter of fact, let's turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, let's look at verse 4. Say the struggle is real when you get there. 
Come on. <laughs> Hebrews 12, 4 says this. In your struggle against sin, you've not resisted to the point of shedding your blood. <laughs> no, I've really been struggling. Have you? Really? What's the sign that you've, that you've really been struggling? See, in this passage, the word of God is so awesome. It's just like, yeah, you need to quit thinking that you're fighting harder than you are. If you're trying at all, we're like, yes, I'm trying with all my might. Really? See, this is passage is showing us that there's a way. That there's a way that we have to do this. This talking about the very, we gotta, should be worried about our, uh, the edge of being of our life here. That we're shedding blood as we're, as we're struggling with this. Might remind you of an elder Baj or a pastor Matt beckoning you to quit complaining and just get yourself in the truck. Because we haven't always struggled as much as we think that we have. Is anybody with me tonight? Is anybody used to saying that you're struggling more than you actually did? You're trying 5%, but you want your brother around you to think you're trying 95%. Of course, brother, I have more to go, but I'm really, really struggling to, to achieve what God has for me. Are you really? Every day you're thinking about it? You're consumed with the thoughts about it? You're spending your every waking moment planning for it, praying about it, getting toward, going everything with everything that you have towards what he's doing? Or are we allowing us to say, yes, pastor, we're LCM. We know how to struggle. We know how to fight. I'm saying... Let's not deceive ourselves tonight. Let's actually take an honest and sober assessment. And I'm saying, get in the fight. I'm saying, struggle harder. I'm saying the things that God has spoken to you. Why have you let them go? Pick them back up. Get on. Get a heart that is full of fire about him and get on with it. Get about the work of doing what he said. Verse five. And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement? I'm trying. I'm, really, I'm trying. I want to, this to be a word of encouragement to you. But we got to be honest before it can be an encouragement to us. Have you for, completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. I'm speaking to you in this house tonight. For some, I say, do not make light of the discipline. And... Do not lose heart. <laughs> You've got to understand both of these when he rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines, oh, there it is. He disciplines the ones that he loves. He allows you to stay in a struggle because it's good for you. The worst thing for us is to get along and just go along. The worst thing for you and I to have, i, I got to be honest with you, I am a terrible human being when I don't have a lot of pressure on me. I get lazy. I don't read the word like I should. I don't really pray like I should. Just relax. No, I can't. Because if I do, I turn into a really, really, really bad person. It's true. We're la we're la I hope you're laughing because you resemble that remark. I am a terrible human being the easier that things are on me. The struggle is so good. It's almost like the Lord loves me and he knows exactly what I need. It's almost like he has things that, that, that like when he put Adam in the garden, the ground was cursed. The thorns and the thistles were there for his sake, for his good, that he needed the difficulty. Come on, church. The right kind of struggle causes you not to forget what the Lord has said. When you were crying out to the Lord and you were in some difficult spot and he spoke something to you, it never it never leaves you. Yeah. Do you know why some of these placards are here? Because it was what the Lord spoke to us as a church when we needed it. Yeah. We were desperate. Lord, we're all by ourselves. What's going on? He said, you work on one life at a time. We're going to change one life at a time. Okay. Then you move forward and you never forget it. Lord, I'm always worried about where you've put me. Am I missing something? He said, my boundary lines for you have fallen in pleasant places. It never left my soul. Not for one day. 
How easily are you and I forgetting, though, what he's speaking to us? Maybe we need to get in the struggle more and we'd actually remember what he's saying. Come on, we don't need to make light and we don't need to lose heart. We need to keep and stay in the fight because that's what he does for those that he loves. The struggle is real. It refines every area of your life. The struggle in us refines every area of life. And that's why we need it so desperately. Since you're in Hebrews, let's turn to Hebrews chapter 3. See to it, brothers. See to it, brothers. That none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today. So that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ. If indeed we hold to our original conviction firmly to the end. It says see to it. You're going to have to struggle to see to it. I mean, we're going to have to work at it. It doesn't come. If, if you want somebody to prove to you that it doesn't come just by doing nothing, come talk to me. <laughs> it doesn't come if I don't work at it. An unbelieving heart. Now, this isn't the heart of an unbeliever. This is to us. Wow. The struggle has been too much. What did, what did Pastor Matt uh, tell us Sunday? It's too much. I can't carry the weight. But I'm not built for this. The thing that you made me for, I'm not built for it. <laughs> These things are trying to steal the right struggle yeah. in us. We're being kind of tongue-in-cheek with the use of the word struggle because, to be honest, in today's society, it's become a, a bad word. Like, oh, you, you shouldn't be struggling with that. Yeah, you shouldn't be struggling with sin, but you should be struggling with the, to, to carry out the things that God has told you to do. Yeah. Amen. That's the struggle that we want to embrace. That struggle is a joy because there's a promise attached to it that if you don't quit, it will work out exactly how he says. It says here that you, we're supposed to encourage one another daily. We got plenty of encouragements in this room. We got elders and pastors who hold to the standard. We got disciples like Nick Arizona who hold to the standard. We got men like Adam Cora who holds to the standard to leave what is behind and strain towards what is ahead when the Lord calls. Amen. Has that been encouraging anybody? Yeah. I thought so. We got men like Andrew Tisdale, who is leading in new ways, stretching out in new ways. We got a side the line of God who is applying the, the Lord's discipline in his family, and it's going to produce fruit. Amen. These men are encouragements. Glenn Hilton, who's going after the word in a vigorous way, that is an encouragement to me. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not separated from that. I want to, to urge and, and desire and hunger after the word the way he is. We have come to share in Christ if we hold. If we hold. It's a struggle. Yeah. Something must be trying to wrestle it away from us. Fears about it not working out. If, 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 if I give it my all, if I really go after it, it's not going to work out. Like, for me. They're like, I'm the one person. And, and pastors use that example all the time. And it still shows up in our hearts. I'm the one person that if I really go after it, it's not going to work out for me. Laziness is still in our, our ability to struggle the right way, to struggle like a warrior, to struggle like David, to learn things about God as we carry out God's acts. We got to get it out of here. Hold to the original conviction. The struggle is real. Like Jacob, Struggling until a blessing. Like until the weed stood up. And, and, until it matured. Jesus struggling until the enemy was defeated. Not, not stopping right before the cross. Until. And not even stopping after. Like the men in this room who are struggling, fighting, wrestling. There are men in this room who are struggling and fighting for godliness in ways that some might not even know about in the, in, the, in the quiet place. And that is bearing fruit on the outside. 
That's what we need. The struggle is real. Refining every area of life. Come on, turn with us to Acts chapter 14. Look, we just have a few minutes left here together tonight. But we've got to get this struggle right. You've got to quit pushing away from the right kind of struggles. You've got to quit pushing away from those difficulties in your workplace. Did you hear me? You've got to quit pushing away from those difficulties in the workplace. You've got to embrace that struggle because you can see what God is doing inside of you. You can entrust yourself to him. Look at Acts 14 and verse 21. They preached the gospel in that city and won a large number of disciples. Well, praise God. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples, encouraging them to do what? To keep the struggle real, yeah. to remain true to the faith. We must go through every once in a while, in a very selective kind of manner, slight difficulties. It's ridiculous. So let's not live in that perverted translation that I just gave you. Yeah. I'm being as ridiculous as I can be in a translation, but is this not what we lower ourselves to often? Yeah. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. You've got to. As a matter of fact, you start understanding that this is what God wants for you, and it puts a smile on your face. When the day is difficult, you're like, yes! Thank you, Lord. It's putting to death those things in me that I thought that I had long since conquered. Look at that. My own flesh rose up. Yes, I get to put it down and conquer it today. Yeah. I get to see what's really going on inside of me. I can see whether I love him enough. I can see. I can feel it. And I get to deal with it rightly because this struggle is real. It's going to refine me in every area of my life. And I want it to do that. I'm asking for it to do that. And I rejoice that it is doing that in me. Can somebody say amen? amen. amen. That's powerful. Church, what, what, I, what I hear pastors saying there, what is speaking to me, is that I don't have to try and fail. I don't have to uh, struggle. I don't have to attempt and then fail and fall back. I can try until I succeed. Lord, change my outlook. Change, change my perspective to try until I succeed. That's the tenacity that we need in this place. That's the, the tenacity that I need, that the Lintons need. In Acts 20, verse 23, I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. The struggle is real and it's for finding every area of my life. Starting to refine those desires that I didn't know I had. It's starting to refine the laziness that, that's, that's lied dormant and unchecked. My aim is becoming... Lord, I want to accomplish what you told me to. And I can't say I didn't know. I got plenty of direction. I can't say I can't because that's just stupid. Lord, I'm, I'm, we say it. Lord, I want to hit the mark. Not for selfish motives. Not for selfish ambition. Lord, because I love you. And you started it. You love me first. Lord, Help me refine these areas out of my life so that I can attain the goal. So that my life, so that the struggle can be real in my life. I want the struggle to be real in my life. Church, there's a revelation that, that came to me a few years ago. And it's changed everything about me. Where's Bonnie? Bonnie was in the back. He and I were walking around the block yesterday. And we were talking about this feature. Do you understand that as long as you just don't give up, as long as you stay engaged in the struggle, he will make you be what you're supposed to be. If you can really get it, I know heads are nodding and you guys are, are, are an incredible group of people, but listen to me, get what I'm saying to you. If you learn how to engage in the struggle and just don't give up, 
You just don't stop. He is going to make you into what you are supposed to be. You will fulfill every good purpose that He has intended for you if you just don't give up. If you stay rightly engaged in the battle, He can take you. He can make you. He can strengthen you. But it doesn't happen when you pull back from the struggle. The only way that you're going to fail is if you pull back from the struggle. You're afraid you won't make it, so you pull back from the struggle. That's the thing that will make you fail. If you just keep trusting, if you just keep stepping forward when you wish you could step back, but you don't. Amen. Every time that you just say, I don't know if I can make it to the end, but I'm going to make it to this next step and, and I'm going to stand where he tells me. I'm going to make it to the next step and I'm going to keep engaging in the struggle. I'm going to go, I don't know how many more steps, but I know I will give this one. And the only thing that's going to stop me is death. That's when you know that the struggle is real inside of you. That's the tenacity that we need. I'm looking at men and women in this room. And what I can feel in my heart is some of you have already started to say the struggle isn't worth it. It's too much for me to do. The only way you can lose for a real, actual believer is for you to just stop struggling if you just keep fighting he will make you what you're supposed to be he will empower you at every turn i've heard stories of women in this in this very room ready to give birth they're at the precipice of new life coming forth and what are the two things that women are known to say in those moments if they're, if they're doing it in a natural kind of way without the help of doctors and medicine? I can't do it. I'm about to die. Is that true or not? All the, all, <laughs> says the most pregnant one in the room, I think, right now. No, the struggle is real, Pastor. Think with me for a second. Let's take a very, very, especially in our church, we all understand this, this, this concept very well. The two things that you say are, I'm about to die, and I can't do this. You were literally put on the planet to do that. You were literally made to do the very thing that you're saying, I can't, I'm going to die, I'm pretty sure it's going to cost me everything. On the verge of actual life coming forth from you. At least that's just for the women, huh? God, I can't do this. I'm pretty sure I'm going to die right here because I just can't. You're literally made to do it. You're literally made for the fight. You're literally made for the struggle. We are building something special in this place. It's not whether you choose to have an epidural for your pregnancy or not. It's whether you choose to stay involved in the struggle. In First Chronicles, I'm just going to say it and then we'll move on to the next scripture. First Chronicles 12 and verse 21 it says they helped David against raiding bands for all of them were brave warriors. All of them. Somebody say all of them. Uh huh. They were all brave warriors. They were all commanders in his army. Next verse. Day after day, men came to help David. They just stayed in the battle. They just came back day after day. I'm not asking you to be a hero for the rest of your life. I'm asking you to stand up and struggle today. Amen. And then you go to bed and you let the Lord reset everything in your life and you get up and you do it again. I'm asking you to do this one day at a time, day after day. But what did they come and do until they had a great army? Amen. Why are we talking to you about struggle tonight? We could have just left it in the bulletin and you would have said, yes, yes, we should struggle rightly. Amen. Let's move on. It's because 
we heard from the Lord in prayer about what we should speak to you. And we said, Lord, you're building a great army in this house. You're building, it's not just a great army. Because that might mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. Look at the last phrase in the verse. Like the army of God. Come on, Ray. Come on, Chris. Come on, Cho. We're building an army here. And this is the tenacity that is required of every man. Of every woman in this house. Your bravest response should not be when you gave birth. That has a finite amount of time that you have to deal with that. Our men and our women here in this house are becoming a great army. And it's because we understand that the struggle is in fact real. And it's supposed to be refining every area of our life. Let's turn to Psalm 119. This is the attitude we have to learn to cultivate. One nineteen sixty seven. We got to be able to settle this in our hearts and tell the Lord this. Believe it and then do with it what he wants it to accomplish. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. Nobody in here is going to tell me that's not true. So I won't even ask. This part, though, where we got to get to. But now I obey your word. Lord, let the struggle, because I'm not trying to dodge it anymore. Let the struggle, because I'm not trying to make excuse about anything anymore. Lord, let your struggle teach me to obey your word. In verse 71, it says, this is the attitude we had to take on. It was good for me to be afflicted. David wasn't saying that tongue in cheek. It was good for me to be afflicted so that I might learn your decrees. The law from your mouth is more precious to me than thousands of pieces of silver and gold. What did the struggle teach men? What did the struggle teach Jacob? What did the struggle teach Abraham? What did it teach Adam? What did it teach David? It taught them about a new identity that they had to walk in. It taught them about a promise that went through the generations that was contingent on their obedience. It taught them that, man, you are built to deal with frustration. You are built to deal with the struggle and put things underfoot. This is what you were created for. I made you for this task. Taught David how to hold on to his God. How to be dependent. How we don't need comforts. We don't need the things that we think we need. God knows what we need. And he's providing the opportunities for our struggle. We want to see it the right way. For our last scripture of the evening, let's turn to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5, and we're going to start in verse 7. It says this, During the days of Jesus' life on earth, He offered up prayers and petition with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save Him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. (laughs) How do you think that you and I are going to be heard? Through the exact same way that he was heard. I want you to take a look at verse 8. This is an amazing way to say this. Son, though he was. Son, though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. He learned obedience from the struggle in his life, just like we are going to learn obedience from the struggle in our life. And he was not exempted, son though he was. The son had to learn obedience through struggle. How are you and I going to learn obedience? Through struggling. 
through wrestling, through getting after it. And once made perfect, He became the source of eternal salvation for all who would obey Him. His struggle and obedience through it allowed Him to be the source of eternal salvation for all who would walk in the same way that He does. Understanding that the struggle is real. And He was designated by God to be the high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Church, no matter how many scriptures that we bring to you tonight, the truth is, is you have to be willing to engage in this struggle and engage in it in a way that lets you be a joyful on the inside that says, you know what? This is what Jesus had to do. I'm not discouraged when I struggle. It's actually affirming to me. I can have joy. Why? This is difficult. Yes. But I know that it's going to produce in me. It's going to make me part of the same family as He is. He will not be ashamed of me because we are of the same substance. That what He went through is also what I can go through and I can do it joyfully. Those same tears of difficulty and despair that a woman has right before a birth. What are they immediately replaced with? An overwhelming sense of joy. An overwhelming sense like that was the most difficult thing ever. Let's do it again. My wife said that to me after one of our kids was born and I was like, what? She was overwhelmed with the joy and the life that was brought forth. The Apostle John in Revelation addresses everyone <laughs> as a brother and a companion in the suffering kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Christ. <laughs> uh, Nat, would you put up uh, Revelation 1 9? I, John, your brother and companion, in the suffering and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are ours in Jesus Christ. What's your lot in life? What have you been given? I know what I've been given. I've been given the chance to suffer and the kingdom and the patient endurance that is needed to actually go forth with this. I'm going to ask everyone in the room to stand with me right now. God is refining you through your struggles. Can somebody say amen? amen? God is working into you what He desires through your struggles. Can somebody say amen? amen? He is refining every area of your life. Can somebody say that's real? You're a church that is fantastic at an altar call. So I'm going to change it up on you tonight. If you need prayer because the struggle that you need to get the right kind of perspective on your struggle, I'm going to ask Judah and Nick and our elders to come and be ready. But the truth is, is you're not going to get out of the struggle that you have to do anyway. Whether you run down here and make a hundred vows to the Lord or not, you got to get up and get actually get in the struggle and let it refine you and let it work on you. So we're going to do it a little bit differently. Of course, come down the altar if you need prayer. We're going to have men of God who know what it's like to endure. Who understand what the Apostle John is saying here. And saying, yes, suffering in the kingdom and patient endurance are ours in Jesus Christ. Of course, we will pray for you. But for the rest of us, it's just an attitude shift that we need. It's an understanding that starts going, <laughs> I like the struggle because it's doing something good in me. It's refining me. It is refiring me. It is causing something that one time I thought that I couldn't. I even thought I might die, but I realized that that means life is right there before me. Raise your hands up to the Lord now. Mighty God, help us now. 
Help us now, Lord, that we know that we like the suffering, that we want it, Lord, that we're ready for it because we know that it is refining every area of our life. Mighty God, let this be a church that doesn't just say it, that doesn't have a few special forces, but that the entirety of this group is an army, like the very army of God. Lord, resilient, pressing forward, not letting go, not if it takes us all night or all week or all year. God, that we will fight for you, that we will struggle because it is going to produce your character in us. Move in our hearts tonight.